I'm David Clayton, and this is the Way of Beauty podcast, conversations on Catholic faith and culture. This is episode 10, Rachel Fulton Brown on how a true medieval style devotion to Mary will save the faith and the culture. So I just thought I, I'd explain first how I came across you. Um, I was recommended to listen to Tom Wood's podcast. Uh, and he, of course, was interested in those who know Tom Wood's his show uh, in the um, political aspects that of uh, what's happened to you recently. So you're a um, on the faculty of the University of Chicago. You teach medieval history. Is that correct? And you have a, a special interest in uh, Mary, the history of Mary and devotion uh, in that period, and. As in the course of studying this, from what I, I heard, you converted to Catholicism, which caused great interest to me. Um, and then uh, trouble ensued for you at the, <laughs> with the, the, the other faculty, even at the, as Tom Woods noted, he didn't expect there to be uh, strong objections from the rest of the faculty at the, the Department of Medieval History at the University yeah, of Chicago. I'm, I'm in history, not there, there's no Department of Medieval History. Ah, okay, in the, the history which, which explains some of it, right? I'm ah, okay, but but you are a medievalist, then is that is that the way to okay? Um, so Tom focused on that, but in the, and it was very it was very very interesting to hear everything that erupted in the last year or so, I think, from what he was saying. Um, but in the course of that, you just made an offhand comment um, in talking about your conversion. Um, and you said also that you thought that um, we need to rediscover a devotion to Mary in order to transform the culture. And that is my particular interest. And it, I, I really just wanted to talk to you to find out more about that. Um, but before we get onto that specifically, I, I am curious. I'm a convert. I converted about 20 years ago in England. And the, the beauty of Catholic culture as it was, I guess, was uh, uh, influential in that. And the beauty of the liturgy that I saw at a church in the Brompton Oratory. So I have a strong focus on the liturgy. Um, now, I'm just curious to know, what's your conversion story? How did your work and your study lead you to convert? It, well, it, conversion stories, I suppose, I, would, I assume they're like love stories. They're more interesting to the person that went through them than they necessarily are to how you got there, uh, to, to people listening. Um, the the, the medium-length version is I grew up Presbyterian and was confirmed in the Presbyterian Church, but when I went through our confirmation classes, age 13 or so, felt like there was something missing in the explanation, particularly of the Eucharist, right? In the Presbyterian yeah. Church, you grow up and communion's only once a month, and it was very specifically reserved for the adults. And so I was hoping, you know, on being confirmed that there was, you know, you're, you're let into the great mystery. And of course, what I felt like was, well, where was it? Um, and with that with that thought in mind when i got to college and was doing courses in history of christianity european history medieval history um we had a reading from uh one of the scholars who became my dissertation advisor caroline walker bynum on the eucharistic devotion of medieval women and caroline did just a, a magnificent job of explaining how in the Middle Ages, when people were receiving the Eucharist, particularly um, the women who she was focusing on, it was this becoming, becoming, you know, you becoming one with Christ, but you're you're eating His flesh and drinking His blood, and that is this this mm. transformation. And I, I was like, well, this sounds more like it, right? <laughs> and so I, I started reading her work, and I was particularly fascinated when she talked about. Um, the relationship that these women mystics had with Christ and curious about why she said they didn't have a, a, the kind of relationship that you would expect with Mary from other reading that I was doing in, in the same period. That feminist theologians in the 1980s were often complaining that the image of Mary was, was, was either damaging to women or wasn't sufficiently goddess-like or or something and so between these two 
questions. It's like the one, the, the real relationship with God that medieval Christians had and, and where Mary fit. That was, that was really the beginning of my, my scholarship on Mary. Um, my first book, which was built on my dissertation, was a study of commentaries on the Song of Songs, uh, in which Mary is given the role of the bride and Christ is given the role of the bridegroom. Um, this is a little controversial mm -hmm. <laughs> since she's his mother. Um, what kind of relationship are they, they trying to explore? And it, it, it came out of the liturgy. It came out of the ways in which um, medieval Christians praised her as um, the one in whom God became present. I didn't quite understand that in, in those terms when I was interested in the, the commentaries. But in my first book, From Judgment to Passion, I try to show some of that mystery of the, of the relationship that Christ and Mary have. Um, but I still wasn't satisfied, right? That there's 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 this this compassion that Mary has for for Jesus, and this this intensity of the of her relationship in which she's described as sharing his flesh, right? He takes his body from her, her flesh. His her flesh is understood to be his flesh. There's a Eucharistic element there, but it's there's still something. It, it felt to me like that human relationship, which um, I emphasized in the first book wasn't quite all of it. And in my second book, which is the one that, that I was talking about with Tom, and I, I just fi finished that, uh, published it this last year, I was trying to find the larger frame in which um, devotion to Mary um, was situated. And to do so, I looked at the, the, um, the office of the Virgin, which is, um, if you're familiar with the divine office, uh, which is the cycle of mm -hmm. Psalms that the, the monks and nuns would say, the, the Marian office was a uh, modeled on that structure, so it has seven hours of prayer in the day and one at night, and you say a series of psalms with chants framing it. And I wanted to understand how that that like description of Mary actually worked. And in the second book, I so I'm sort of doing a commentary on the psalms that's framing my commentary on the Song of Songs, and that's where I I finally got to what I I I hope is a correct appreciation of of what medieval Christians saw in Mary, which is as this temple, right? She's the temple in which Christians pray to not just her son, but to the Trinity, that they understand the Trinity revealed through her in the relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Um, how does this lead to my conversion? <laughs> well, I'd say I, you know, I grew up Presbyterian, and we're very concerned with, you know, we're very concerned with Scripture. We're very concerned with reading the Word, and so that my scholarship began with that problem of, well, how did medieval Christians read Scripture concerning Mary? With when I finished the 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 the, the new book, it was it was almost as if I couldn't say no anymore, right? It's like I I I, I think I see. The way in which they're describing her, and one of one of the methods that I use to try to write the book is this exercise of imagine yourself saying the office as reader, and mm. I, 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 you know, it's sort of the, the I, I, I'm saying this is the medium length answer. Obviously, there's there's more going on in it, but it was it was in trying to really see through their exegesis, through their interpretation, that I I came to a sense that. There's no way I can I can simply go to communion anymore. I need to I need to be there in the presence at mass and recognizing that 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 is the understanding that that the church the, the Catholic Church has of, of communion. I I said okay this is this I I need to to come home as as we say it. <laughs> uh, but it, yes. it's been a very long journey. I mean it's it's something you know it's it's <clears throat> 30 40 years of meditating on the problem. Um, so I've always considered myself Christian, but with the sense that I was, I was, you know, grew up feeling outside and was still outside until I, I took the step in to be confirmed. Right. Um, which what you're describing is, is interesting to me because, uh, my understanding is that the role of Mary is, is to lead us to her son anyway. And, and so... The fact that this actually happened for you in this way <laughs> through an intellectual um, just journey initially is, is very interesting. Um, well, now, it works, right? Yes. It, it, she, is, she is in the in the commentaries that I've been looking at for the, this, the newest book. She is wisdom herself, Sapiencia, because she's the mother of wisdom, uh, Christ. And um, one of the meditations that 
particularly in the 13th century, her, her um, commentators had was that how she is filled with all knowledge, right? He's mm. the creator. She contains the creator. So she is filled with all knowledge of, of, of the creatures. And so that it was an intellectual journey for me th that was also a devotional journey. It, to me, seems entirely appropriate. And that it was Mary that led me in that path, that I had, I have a, a little meditation that I did back in college when I was um, doing a course on Christianity or the religions of the West. Um, it was part of the, the, the um, religious studies degree I was doing, which we did Eastern religions and Western religion. And in the Western religion one, we were, I had this meditation on, on praying for wisdom, right? And of course, when... <laughs> When I finished the book, I figured, you know, be careful what you wish for, <laughs> be careful mm. what you pray for, because 30 years later, you know, I've been dragged along in answer to that prayer. And it, it, it has been a difficult journey because it's it's trying to read things that nobody has been reading for hundreds of years, right, and trying to see how they were living devotional exercises, not just, you know, dry sort of cataloging of, of interpretation. Yes. Um, the, th the thought that comes to mind as, as I was listening to you to, to describe how Mary is the, in, a, in a some sense, the full of wisdom as well as full of grace, um, is the image of Hagia Sophia, um, her female personification of wisdom. Is there any historically any connection between those two ideas that you know of? Have you discovered anything there? Well, so you mentioned that I'm, I'm in, you know, midst of controversies. I think, you know, the controversies I'm really in are in the, in this kind of argument, right? It's like exactly what kind of lineage does the 13th century Latin Western devotion to Mary have? And one of the arguments I, I make in my book is that it's, it's a very old tradition that goes back through the Orthodox recognition of Mary as, as the temple. Um, mm. Certainly Hagia Sophia is there and certainly that, 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 that sense of her as, Wisdom, it, it's it's there in the Council of Ephesus and the sermons around the Council of Ephesus when she's recognized as Theotokos. I argue it's also there even earlier. It's there in the early Apocrypha where she's described as weaving the veil for the temple. And you right. realize she is there already in, say, the Protevangelium of James, which is the, the source that we have for the stories right. about her her childhood and, and she grew up in the temple. She grew up serving God as, as one of the, the, the makers of the veil. That veil imagery is very, very important for understanding um, the, the sense of what the Holy of Holies itself contained in, the, in, in these Marian stories. She's said to be the Holy of Holies, right? She's said to be the place where God is present. So that, that Sophia character, um, I, I mentioned that I, I came to this through um, scriptures that the, the Song of Songs is one of the most important books for the Marian liturgies. Ecclesiasticus um, is another, and that is, of course, the great book of wisdom. So she, Mary is, is understood in her liturgies to be speaking as wisdom when she says, you know, I am the one in whom the Lord set up his tabernacle and made his dwelling. Um, she's also read through the wisdom character in Proverbs. Um, those are texts that are used, of course, in the, in the West to... Um, argue for the doctrine of her immaculate conception, but they're they're really more important to say she is the one she is wisdom there with the Lord from the beginning, um, and how you understand that is 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 you know doctrinally complicated if you if you worry about um, things from the perspective of her whether she's created with or without um, in, uh, incurring original sin, but she is that she's wisdom who was there with God in, in his creative mm. activity is the most important part of the mystery. And so, yeah, Hagia Sophia, the Holy Wisdom, the Church of the Holy Wisdom, I mean, she she is that temple of Holy Wisdom because she is the mother of Holy Wisdom. Great. I, I, I want to come back to the importance of Scripture uh, later on. But I something that I learned recently is that um, in the early church, catechumens used to study the book of Proverbs as part of their preparation, which given what you've just said makes perfect sense, that not only is it giving them a, um, a graspable rule of life in, in, in a sense, but um, underlying that is the person through whom we approach Christ most deeply, um, just uh, thinking uh, in analogously. So uh, very, very interesting. Um, all right, so let's go on now uh, to a little bit more about the, the, the way in which people express their devotion to Mary. 
say in the 13th century, you, you can pick a typical period, um, and how that might have uh, affected, how that contrasts with today, because people today, today are within the church, uh, there are plenty of people who are devoted to Mary, I would say, um, uh, and uh, yet uh, it, it's clearly, I, I think something's missing. There seem to be these uh, paradoxes because uh, one thing that I sense, and I, I'm not sure exactly how to articulate this, is that there is the feeling that the, the Roman church particularly has become feminized in the wrong way. Um, there's a, and again, this might be unfair to women. I suddenly thought about this a few days ago, but there's a sentimentality which as, as a man, I just don't like at all. Now, maybe that's not a feminization. It, it's, it's something else. It's, um, but whatever it is, the, this understanding of the, in, the, the relationship between the sexes and our relationship to Christ and to Mary seems to be wrong. And I just have a, a, a deep sense of it, um, particularly because when I looked at the Eastern Church, uh, I got a very different sense of the devotion to Mary. And, and as a man, somehow, I assumed it was because I was a man, maybe it's just me, um, I found that their emphasis on the liturgical centre of everything uh, to be much better to grasp. So you approach Mary through the feasts in the liturgical year or something like that. Um, anyway, so that's what that's what I, immediately I was thinking about when you were speaking. But please, uh, if you could describe... Um, what the devotion was like, and then contrast it. What's missing today, or what is additional today which shouldn't be there, as it strikes you? Well, the liturgy. I, I think you're right. Um, that so, 13th century is a good is a good period to focus on because it's it's when the forms that I've been talking about come into their sort of fullest um, practice. Um, the Ave Maria, the Hail Mary, is a very important practice. But mm. what people tendency to think about it today, or at least in some of the mo more modern literature I've read, is, is you can end up with it feeling like what people think of as a mantra, right? If you just, yes. if you just repeat it repeat it enough, it, it sort of works because of the repetition or the breath control or something like that. Um, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the high Middle Ages, it's a, it's a very specific kind of meditation, and you can see some of that, I think, in the, in the meditations in the rosary, but again, modern Christians, it seems to me, and I'm you know, forgive me, audience, if you, if you actually have these devotions and I don't know. It's just I, I haven't come across them in in the, in the reading in the, the modern meditations that I've seen. But that um, modern Christians tend to typically be focused much more on the earthly mysteries of of Mary and, and Christ. So that we're we're sort of re always reading through the 19th century search for the historical Jesus, right? And so the kinds of things that you're responding to, David, that you're saying this seems too sentimental, this doesn't seem terrifically robust, it seems too feminized, I would simply say it's too earthly, right? Ah. And, and, and in, in, the earthly, in the earthly meditations, you're focusing constantly on whether or not Mary's a good model for women, right? Which drives me nuts. Um, or, <laughs> <laughs> you know, what, what's lost, and this is, I, th I think this is a very significant element in modern Christianity, what's lost is, of course, the Trinity, yeah. um, and, and likewise, to a certain extent, the mystery of the Incarnation, because we're not taking the divinity seriously. In the, in, the, in the Middle Ages, they're taking the divinity very, very seriously. And the mystery is, how could God have humbled himself so much as to enter into his creation, right? That it's, it's the entering into his creation that's the great mystery of, of um, Mary's maternity. I mean, I've also seen that, you know, it seems like modern Christians worry about her, her, her divine maternity. But I, I'm not saying, are you really thinking about what that means? Are you thinking about what it means for the creator of everything to have, entered into his own work, right? And um, my, my favorite phrasing of this is um, from Ans one of Anselm of Canterbury's prayers, where he talks about how Mary showed to the world the creator whom it had not seen, right? That she, um, by giving birth to him, makes him visible um, to the world. So in the, in the meditation of the Ave Maria in, in the High Middle Ages, what's, what you're meditating on is this entry of God into his creature, into, into his creation. And... Um, the, the if there's an if there's a sentimentality to it or an emotion to it it's the mary's rapture as it were at that moment in which she feels god present in her and there's some miracle stories in which she 
sort of cautions people to slow down um, while they're saying the Ave Maria, saying, no, 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 <laughs> when you, every time you say it, I feel again what it was like for my son to be incarnate in me, right? And in my book, I, I sort of compared that to the feeling of, you know, like if you've had butterflies in your stomach when you sense, see your loved one, or if you've been pregnant and <laughs> you feel your child moving within you for the first time, it's like, that's God, right? And And so... You should be whenever you're saying the Ave Maria, it should be as this this amazingly erotic exercise for Mary because you're reminding her over and over and over again of what it was like in that moment when she knew herself to be pregnant with God. Um, that 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 sort of Mary as framing of of the Creator is also what is at stake in saying her hours in saying this office of the Virgin. The Ave Maria, although we think of it now as this sort of independent chant, as it were, or thing that you say with the rosary. In fact, what it originally was, was the invitatory <clears throat> antiphone to the hours of the Virgin. So it's the, the, and that's why people were encouraged to say it on its own, because you couldn't say the full office of Mary, you could say the Ave as a kind of synecdoche of it. You could say it as a substitute for being able to say the whole thing. But if you said the whole thing, you were saying a series of psalms in which you're, in effect, praising God as the creator who Mary contained, and and in my in my new book, I, I go through this exercise of trying, uh, suggesting a, a reading of, of the Marian Office by way of this framing of the the antiphones, the chants that you say before and after the Psalm, frame the Psalms themselves, and that that mystery is what the the Office is 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 meant to to help you speak your way into, right? And uh, another of the the problems that mo many modern Christians have with thinking about um, devotion to Mary's, if they're at all familiar with the office of the Virgin or with the books of ours, the books that medieval Christians used to say it, they they think of it as something that's focused on these earthly scenes, right? On the nativity, on the, mm -hmm. the, the, the visit of the Magi or the adoration of the Magi on the flight into Egypt, because those are the images that were used to, to um, mark each of the, the different hours in, in the books. But of course, if you actually use the books, you recognize that to say the Psalms, you're not looking at the pictures. <laughs> you're, you know, you turn the page, right? You say the opening um, chant, and then the Psalm itself is what you are. And again, it's 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 a twinning of affect and intellect that I I think modern devotion tends not to privilege anymore or to appreciate. That you are, if if what you're 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 seeing in the earthly story or these scenes from Mary and Christ's earthly life, what you're saying through the Psalms are, are the same chants that the angels say before the throne of God. So there's this sort of earthly frame for the heavenly reality. And it's it's like, it's, it's, it's the same way in which you can say Mary is the Holy of Holies, that she, in her physicality, in her, in her maternity, frames the heavenly reality that um, God became present in her as if in heaven. And if you're familiar with the Orthodox Liturgy. One of its its um, most wonderful chants is this um, chant where you, Mary is the one who contained him whom the heavens could not contain. So she is in fact a kind of heaven, right? Because she is where God God became. Mm. Um, yes. So that, that answers some of your questions. I think that there, the, some of the differences, the sentimentality that I say you're responding to is this this focus on the earthly and the fleshly and the humanity, which is matters. But it matters only if you appreciate that it's a frame for this this amazing mystery of what it meant for God to enter into that human experience, that human life, mm. and that without the mystery of 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 the Creator and the Trinity becoming, in, you know, and it's not the Trinity obviously the second person that becomes incarnate through her, but because the second person becomes incarnate through her, it's also a revelation of the Trinity because before the second person becomes incarnate through her, we don't appreciate the Father and the Spirit either. Right. Now this, I think, that's great. I, I, I think this brings us then to um, an appreciation of Scripture. Uh, it, this is something, I've been a Catholic for 20 years, and I would say only recently, as I've been involved in trying to organize some scripture classes for this Master of Sacred Arts that I'm involved in. And I, uh, Father Sebastian Canazzo, who teaches it, um, is a Melkite uh, and focuses very strongly on the Church Fathers, so the Byzantine Catholic. Um, and I, this really opened my eyes. It was a new sort of study for me. Um, and 
what really came through for me is this sense of all of scripture telling a story of salvation history and there are the historical events but um, there is also um, everything is speaking in some way of the death um, and then the resurrection and the ascension of Christ into heaven and, and through the sacramental life how we mirror that we uh, we die with Christ, we rise with Christ in confirmation or chrismation, um, and then by through the Eucharist we partake of the divine nature and are transformed supernaturally um, as in a way that is by degrees showing us the, uh, the, the promise of what will be given to us fully, which is uh, bodily resurrection. And all of the scripture is speaking of these things and um, we because i i'm interested in art and i paint icons um, we would talk a lot about the art in the, in the church and um, looking at some of the, for example medieval baptistries um, that people the the accounts that i'd read would talk of the art as being didactic it's 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 scripture for the those who can't read um, and I thought, well, that may be so, but they can talk to each other. I don't. Right. I mean, do, do they I, need yeah, the, the can't read part. I think that's a that's a red herring. Uh, yeah. know, Gregory the Great gave us that, and it's 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 a it's a misunderstanding of what the um, visual does. It, it's an alternative presentation, I think, for those who are being told in other ways, and it's emphasising what's going on in the baptistry. So it's drawing out certain aspects of scripture visually, um, and. Uh, the beauty of art can, I think, transmit things that words alone can't. So it's an alternative presentation that reinforces and engages um, with us in such a way that we then engage with what's going on liturgically uh, at that moment. Um, and really seeing scripture in this way, and Mary then is crucial, because in, in the same way, once you start to think analogously, um, Suddenly, there are many, many messages that are being given to us, many stories that are simultaneously being given to us. And then the Psalms, as you say, um, are right at the center of the whole thing and contain all the theology. So that's, that's a Bible in itself, in a way. Um, and that's why it's so much part of what is sung. Um, and my feeling for, for today, for example, for how we can, is to encourage people to pray the liturgy of the hours especially focusing on the feasts of the church which will include these marian feasts and even in the roman liturgy as it is today the antiphons are poignant i think they they, they speak of the sort of things you're talking about um, but certainly scripture uh, is so important um, and i think should be much more part of uh, uh, catechization, for example, the, 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 the way that people are presented with the faith even before they come into the church. Um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I have that. lots of thoughts. So, oh, so yeah. you said first the, the thinking through thinking um, figuratively. I think in terms of reading the scriptures, that when you said you're studying with the Orthodox and you see how the scriptures speak all the time to the mystery. The, yes, this is another of the things that I emphasize about Mary in, in my new book, that uh, as medieval Christians read the scriptures, Mary is everywhere in scripture. Most most modern studies of Mary, almost uh, invariably, right, will begin with some apology. Not very much is said about Mary in the New Testament. It's like, well, one, <laughs> for goodness sake, what you, you should consider is why she's mentioned at all, right? If she's not really that important, why bother, right? There's all mm -hmm. sorts of other, quote, details about Christ's earthly life that aren't mentioned, right? His childhood growing up from, you know, much of it. That modern biographical expectations are say, oh, yes, of course you talk about his mother. It's like, no. Mary is there in Luke, in Matthew, in John. Mark is obviously a little inter in interesting because she doesn't really have a main character, main role there. But she's in the Gospels because something about the fact that the Lord had a mother really mattered. Right, and it, it mattered that 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 she, um, you know, consented to the incarnation in the way that she does in in, in Luke. It mattered that she bore witness to him. I mean, that in John, she's she's there about the beginning and the end of his earthly ministry. Right, that she's the one who says, you know, make some wine, <laughs> um, do, you know, do something, and mm. and the one who speaks under his cross. So she is, 
she's literally the frame for him in his in his in his in his um revelation right but Medieval Christians understood her there. I mentioned that they see her as wisdom, but they also see her as just as Christ is spoken of throughout the Old Testament because he fulfills the, the scriptures. So she is everywhere in scripture. And they say this in, in the 13th century explicitly that all scriptures, you know, mention her. And in some of the texts that I've, I've been working with for the last several years, they, 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 look for all the instances in which she's named. Now, how is she named? Because, well, she's Miriam. They see her as a, just as Christ is a, is a, a David figure. She's like the sister of Moses and Aaron, a, Mir a Marian figure, a Miriam figure, that's her name. Um, but she's also all of these different places in which God shows himself or becomes present. So she's the temple, but she's also the ark. She's the tabernacle. She's the holy mountain. She's the city of Jerusalem. Um, she's the cloud in which the Lord sits in Exodus. She's um, all of the creatures of creation. As I said, she contains the creator, so all of the creatures speak of her. It's, it's this wonderful sense of the inexpressibility of, of describing God it is the expressibility of describing the mother of God. And so the exegesis is not just about what it means for her. I mean, modern exegesis tends to focus simply on the Gospels or maybe sometimes on Revelation, which is also a a showing of, of the mother. But in, in medieval exegesis, she's everywhere in the same way Christ is everywhere, right? Christ is everywhere in the Psalms. He's the Lord spoken of in the Psalms. Well, if you're singing the Psalms in her office and framing your exegesis of, of those Psalms with her, she's also in the Psalms as, for example, um, in Psalm 86, um, the, the holy city of God. Glorious things are said of you, O city of God. Well, that's understood to be her right she's the mm. place where God comes present she's the city yeah. um that this is this is expressed visually I, I i find that this is it's it's an interesting sort of problem for me as an academic because being protestants and the Ang the the english speaking tradition is heavily protestant in all of its all of its um mm. norms right that we in the academy um privilege you know verbal argument over or over visual arguments is very interesting that that I just to push myself into my sort of more my public controversial role a little bit that what I recognize is some of the things that people are getting most upset about in modern culture are pictures. I find that very, very interesting, right? It's like we're in this iconographical hysteria. You can say memes. I say iconography. Mm. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. Pictures, pictures are clearly charged in a way that words aren't, which you can say is why we, you know, we're we're in the, we're on the cusp of a real moment of the new iconoclasm, right? It's like not just with the historical statues, but with all representations of mysteries through images, and and therefore clearly, pictures do something just more than teach the people who can't read, right? They they clearly have a a power and a and a a, a wisdom and a mystery of their own, which, um, you know, pro the Protestant church rejected outright. They burned all of the statues of Mary in, in England in, in, the, in the 16th century because, you know, they're I idols or something. No, they're showing something that can't be expressed in words. And when I do talks on, on this material now, I realize I, the only way I can show you what I'm actually talking about is to show you what I'm talking about. Mary making mm. visible, Mary making visible. And, and if you make icons, you understand that, that premise, right? That, that, you know, that the image is showing, it was referring to its archetype, but it's also showing something that words are literally inadequate to do. And, and you could say that's what the incarnation was too. It's, it's the word becoming flesh. There are things that God wanted to show us that he could not speak through the prophets. So he has to become incarnate in order for those things to be shown. Yes, and one of the things that, that that's terrific. One of the things that I, I'm always going on about when I, when I when I talk to people about this is this. It's so important to get used to the idea of actually looking and seeing things visibly as speaking of something beyond itself. And so, um, even in traditional liturgies, and I, I love the, the traditional Latin uh, mass, for example, um, but in a beautiful church, it, the, the, very often they will have good taste, not always, but they will, they understand the need for, for a beautiful setting for it. 
but the way in which it's worshipped, it's eyes closed, hands clasped. There isn't this engagement that you get um, with, if you go to an Eastern liturgy, for example, where every time uh, the mother of God is mentioned, the priest comes out, incenses the icon, everybody turns and looks and addresses those prayers as you described directly to her. Um, and it, not only is that going to enrich and deepen our worship, which of course is the, the most important uh, Christian activity, um, what it does is develop that faculty for seeing um, God, if you like, through his works. Um, and so when we go out into the world, this is where maybe, I would say anyway, that we get into the culture. First of all, we will understand the cosmos, the natural world, in a new way. We'll start to see that symbolically. But it means also that as Christians, we're going to start to create things that reflect all of that, that are informed by this, probably intuitively. We're going to understand how the, the things we create connect with people and speak of something beyond itself. And to me, it's that... Um, faculty which seems to have been so lost in the culture I don't know how well developed it is in me at least I'm aware that I don't have it and I so for example even at mass I consciously look for the saint that's mentioned and try and develop some habit that um, that does this so I does this is this something that comes out in your study at all in the in the practice of the devotions well, yes, and it's also, if I may, the thing that's gotten me into the most trouble oh, <laughs> in, okay. in my in my blogging, right? Because right. one of the <laughs> all right, first of all, tell tell us tell us your, where your blog is. We want to make sure we we get all that. So, what's your blog called? Uh, my blog is Fencing Bear at Prayer. Fencing Bear at Prayer, great. It had a, it had a, it. It's always been a, a blog. It's I, it's about ten years old now. It's always been a blog about learning to pray, right? That's the fencing bear at prayer. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm a fencer. I'm a sport fencer. I compete as a fencer. And one of the things that I originally started to do was to under appreciate the, the analogies between the training that I was undergoing as, a, as an athlete and the spiritual training that monks describe as um, battling with the demons, right? That there's this, mm. this very spiritual practice of dealing with your are they thoughts are they emotions they're the sins they're the temptations and um the first several years on the blog i i, I ended up sort of accidentally in this augustinian confession <laughs> of all of the the ways in which you know i needed to be aware of the temptations to pride the temptations to envy gluttony sloth all all of those and and so the 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 blog became the sort of um practicum for me the spiritual practicum um, but then, I, I, as, as appropriate, right, if, if training in the monastery, you then become able, I think, po possibly, hopefully, to see other things, which is what you've been talking about, how you see the patterns, how you see the imagery, how you see the resonances between yes. the spiritual and the earthly. Uh, so when I started writing about my friend Milo, yeah. oh, yes. okay. <laughs> it was all there, right? And, and it has been, it, to me, it's like, it's so blindingly obvious when he, in his own performances, because he's very well trained in, in these liturgical forms, he was a chorister at Canterbury and, and has obviously read deeply in a lot of the, the scriptural interpretation, um, starts putting them into his, his costumes and his sets and, 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 and the ways in which he engages with people. And I'm sitting there going, well, that's revelation. And, and, there, and, and, and you know, the rest of the world thinks I'm crazy. And he says, uh, she's the only one who sees what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so I'd say, I mean, this is a danger, right? It's, it's a real danger for Christians because when you start, and this is, uh, so I gave you my, my medium-length narration of my conversion, but I, I realized that what I've been doing all those years in reading the commentary, in learning to read the medieval iconography, in learning to see the Marian imagery in the creatures, in in the stories, in the psalms, in the liturgy, it just was all there for me suddenly, right? And I, I did have, the closest I've come to a sense of vision, which I, you know, I'm a very intellectual person, as everybody who talks to me for three seconds understands, <laughs> that it was going to be highly intellectual for me no matter what, but when I, I finished the book, I, and I remember this quite vividly, I was writing a rewriting a paragraph or conclusion at the end of chapter four when I was trying to summarize, sort of draw together all the strands of all of this imagery that 
my 13th century commentators have been working with. And, and you have to, you know, as a writer, you have to put yourself in the mind of the people who you're writing about to really get where they're coming from. And I, I finished this, this sort of summation, and I was just like, that's it. That's there. It's all there. And the, the sense of the reality of the vision was enormous. Uh, and I think it was at that point I realized that I was doomed. I, I had to I had to convert then. Um, Milo helped me a little bit there too because get on with. It. <laughs> That's <laughs> so interesting. Yeah. Um, but that it it's it's this training in in seeing, which is one of the things that I've been really trying to capture in my work. That Mary is is, is if you if you she's described in if you see her as described in Proverbs as wisdom. Wisdom is the one who opens the eyes, right? And and those who don't have wisdom have eyes but cannot see, have ears but cannot hear, and yes. it's both. Right? Seeing yeah. and the hearing. Wisdom will, on the one hand, open your eyes, and then when you see these patterns, the rest of the world will think you're nuts, right? <laughs> and, and certainly the rest of the world thinks I'm a little nuts because I keep saying, but the patterns are there, right? But they're not arbitrary. They're, one, they're not arbitrary. They're very, they're very sort of, highly structured and systematic, um, and two, they, they resonate with each other, so that once you start seeing one, you, you I think you start being able to see how it mm. all sort of comes into focus. Um, but until you see that, it, 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 it will sound, it, it, it's very hard to convince people of the, 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 the um, resonance between all of these, these different forms. Yes, resonance is a good word. Um, I... Uh, one of the, my discoveries in my journey is what I tend to call the mathematics of beauty um, today. But <clears throat> it's these traditional ideas of harmony and proportion which touch music, the patterns of the liturgy, the patterns of the cosmos. Um, and I actually found out about this from um, a group of people associated with the Prince of Wales's School of Traditional Arts, who I th are sort of esoteric wisdom. I, I mean, they... They seem to know deeply about all these religions without actually committing to any of them, as far as I can see. I mean, that might be unfair. Um, but they're always trying to get to the roots of the tradition, and they see them as, as equivalent. But it means that they're very knowledgeable on all of this ancient wisdom. Um, but the, and, and they're very interested in, for example, Islamic geometric patterned art, which is a manifestation of, of, the, of this... Um, mathematics in a way in geometric pattern um, and so <clears throat> I started to look into this and it, I was attracted to it because I could see there was something in it but it just seemed too weird to me as a Christian I, did I dare mention this <clears throat> and then I read Benedict the 16th spirit of the liturgy and he he's that he talks about this and his little book on uh, Called, I think it's called In the Beginning on the book of Genesis, which is just four short chapters. Um, and he makes the connection with Pythagoras and how the Christian fathers brought this in to the church. And it was just as you say, once I, the thing that these people in the, the School of Traditional Arts in London, um, who really, I owe them a debt of gratitude, they introduced all of this to me. The thing that they hadn't made the connection with was the pattern of living and worship. In other words, this is all pointing to Christ, that it's coming out of him uh, in some way and leading us to him. Um, and, it, and potentially this can touch every aspect of the culture. And it was just as you said, I start to, you imagine that they're designing cutlery, plates, not just sort of grand building. Everything is imbued with these, with these ideas. And um, it, it was really a very exciting discovery for me. Um, and really, as I say, I opened up my eyes to a, a new world. I would never have had the, the nerve to do it if I didn't feel I could point to Benedict because uh, it, it's not just the, the, the liberals who... Uh, but also the conservatives would have been very suspicious, I think, of all of this. Um, if I if well, I'd I'd say, yes, I'd it. say, you know, writing about Milo is, is one level of controversy. The stuff I've written about Mary, <laughs> um, it, it's, it's, it's challenging, right? Because I'm also making an argument that sounds yeah. you're sympathetic to, which is a very sort of argument from continuity from ancient traditions. And that is something that in the modern academy we've become very, very wary of. 
partly because it's 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 easy to be wrong, right? It's it's easy to see pa- like Robert Graves in his White Goddess, like everything is a pattern of everything else, right? Yes. And so <laughs> it's it's very easy to or you know a lot of the a lot of the early work on Mary or mid 20th century work on Mary where every single attribute of a goddess is somehow also an attribute of Mary and it's like n- no, yeah. there 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 is a there is a true tradition, and discerning it is is obviously very very challenging. When are you when are you you know leading to Christ, and when are you being sort of drawn astray? And I there was something you said um, talking about looking at images that reminded me of another sensation that I've been having. What you know, there's great bliss of, of this moment when you recognize you're sort of in you're seeing the patterns and you're within the resonances, but the opposite is horror. Right. When when you said and I I in the past year or so been having this and I'm wondering about this as a product of having been confirmed and anointed and, and therefore really brought into the, 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 the vision and understanding is that I have a very hard time looking at stuff that's of this world without literally being horrified. And um, <laughs> it's, it's it's just, you know, I can't watch movies anymore. I don't, yeah. <laughs> you want you want to try. I, I, I understand where you were. Sorry, I, I, I had to jump in there because immediately I started to look at buildings and you can just see this traditional proportion in all buildings across nearly all cultures, except in the West after about the Second World War. So in other words, the centre of our cities are, I, I'm just writing a blog piece, it's either monotony, every, all even spacing or cacophony which is just random. It, 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 you just do what you, f- you feel like. Um, no harmony there at all. Um, and so it becomes very difficult. It, once you're alert to it, and I show people these pictures, and once they see three windows, a three-story building with three different size windows, and this sense of rhythm between the first relates to the second, as the second relates to the third, and then you show how even the early high rises in New York City, for example, they couldn't have everything reducing and have a hundred stories or something. So they introduced features into the building to bracket them together that would correspond so that when you look at the building from a distance, you can see the whole thing, you get this this harmony built into it. Um, now, at that stage, they didn't really understand deeply why they were doing it. They just, they just were doing what they'd been taught in architecture school. So as soon as people started to challenge it, which they did in the early 20th century, they had no arguments really. And sadly, the Christians didn't have any arguments against it. They they almost jumped on the modernist bandwagon. bandwagon. Go on, yeah, carry they'd on. Lost, they'd lost Mary, right? And and the thing is, ah. when when you lose, going back to the feminization thing, when you lose Mary, what we've we've reduced Mary to the feminine, right? When you lose Mary as the place in which God becomes present, you also lose the Trinity, right? And so, what you, I think you, as a man, you said you were responding to this problem. It's like I, the Orthodox tradition is still strongly Trinitarian, right? Yeah. Um, whereas the the Western, I mean, I did a paper a few years ago on 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 the the importance of the Holy Spirit in the 12th century, and recognized that it's like what happened to well, either the Father or the Spirit, after you focus all of your attention on Jesus of history, right? It's like we've, we've, we've lost the entire structure for even understanding those patterns. That I, I think you're right. And the, and the Christians in the West weren't able to d- explain why, because they, in fact, lost their theology. Yes, yes. Um, okay, well, we, we, we probably ought to tie up. This has been absolutely fascinating thank you so much i one thing i uh, we haven't talked about you talked about my friend milo um we maybe we need to explain uh, many people will know him as a controversial figure i i was so pleased that you had the courage really to be associated with him publicly um because uh, he i mean he's clearly not a practicing catholic but he I, I can't, I just find I can't help liking him in the way that he talks about the faith and he has a respect for it and understands it deeply. And in many ways, is, is a better advocate for Catholicism than many Catholics are, as far as I can see. And is prepared to stand up and make the arguments. And I think uh, for all, 
I, I don't know him at all. You're a friend of his. But uh, one thing, I, I just can't help laughing at everything he does. He's, he's very, very amusing and witty. And I find myself even laughing at things that I shouldn't be, which reminds me... Gets of, you that way, doesn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I think also very, very unfairly treated um, in terms of, you know, the way, the way that he's characterised, uh, I've always thought is desperately unfair. So Milo Ianopoulos is who we're, we're yes, talking we, about. Milo, I so, thank you, David. That's so wonderful to hear you say that because, of course, I think I think the real reason that he's come under the attack that he has in the public sphere is because he's so Christian, right? If you if you think about, um, there's the 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 worst thing that was said about him was was anchored on some comments that he made in one of those long podcasts that he made two so, two or so years ago um the drunken peasants video so it, it, it's it's a little you know boys having a kind of uh drunken i think some of them are getting stoned to chat about lots of stuff and he mentioned some of his experiences as a as a teenager, but what really happened in that episode was that those that his his hosts and they had another guest on with him were pushing him constantly about God, right? And and to my mind, it's one of his best videos, it, precisely because they tried everything they could to get him to 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 say, oh, you know, being faithful as as a Christian was a little bit silly, and he refused. He 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 was he was absolutely adamant against you know but a lot of peer pressure from these guys right you know oh well how can you we're you know they're atheist and how can you say that and it's ridiculous and aren't you you know how can you how can you call yourself you know a rational intellectual I can't remember exactly how they phrased it but if you believe in God and Milo's just like no I believe in God and th that over and over and over again that's been the real ground of the arguments that he's made you you say he's sometimes a better Catholic than some of the Catholics right he's he's it, one of his absolutely strongest camp, campus tour talks was his one against abortion. Um, it, the whole point about the article against contraception is because it's within, you know, it's in line with Catholic teaching and he thinks it's appropriate. The, you know, contraception does have these terrible effects on human society um, and he's trying to point to them. He makes it in a joking way and so everybody thinks, oh, he's just a provocateur. But the thing is, he's provoking you to pay attention to the things that nobody yeah. else will talk about. Um, and and deep down, he's he's working on a new book right now. He, he posted a an Instagram picture of its of its title. Um, uh, it's on the the current scandal in the church, and mm. um, he is he is well positioned, obviously, but from his yes. own personal experience, to yes. know a little bit about these sorts of um, situations um, with the sex abuse. But he's also, and this is obviously one of the reasons I'm friends with him, very, very committed to, as he says on his own website, saving the soul of Western civilization. And he means it. And he means the soul. And he means through Christianity. So your sense is right, right? The, the, he, practicing Catholic, who knows? Are, are any of us good practicing Catholics? Well, Catholic absolutely. Yet? Yeah. He's, 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 he, he is more committed to God than almost anybody I've ever talked to. And that's and courageous. That's why I'm willing to stand up for it. Yeah, well, that, that's the thing. He's courageous, and um, I can't believe the people he's prepared to tackle you know, and present these things to. Sometimes, um, and you just think, well, I know. Um, yes, and I think maybe we'll finish there <laughs> but, but but what i want to say is that uh, beauty will save the world and we need to rediscover it we offer something positive that is more powerful than all of this nastiness that is around there if we have the courage to stand up and um present it to people i think um and so we've talked about milo but also i want to thank you for having the 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 courage to do this and face the things you do and um i i hope we can talk again sometime it's been an absolute pleasure uh, why don't you tell us again just where people can find you and um i'm sure people want to know more about your books where we where they can even if it's just mentioning your website again so that people know how to get hold of you if they want to talk to you okay great um so my my blog is fencing bear at prayer and if you're interested in my writing about Milo, there's a page there called the Milo Chronicles, um, which will 
lists all of the posts in order um, about him. Um, if you want my academic work, my homepage is Rachel Fulton Brown. Um, the URL is hard to say, but just Google me as Rachel Fulton Brown and you'll find my academic homepage. Um, mm -hmm. There I have listed all my academic publications and um, my books so that you can you can see those. Um, I also do a podcast um, with some friends of mine called Three Craters Symposium, and um, we invite oh. you to visit us there. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. YouTube as Three Craters Symposium. Okay. Well, we'll just end quickly with a prayer. I'll just say in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You've been listening to the Way of Beauty podcast, conversations on Catholic faith and culture. For more information, go to thewayofbeauty.org. And if you want to buy the book, go to Amazon.com. <laughs>